you were, you were the hardy band that has stayed for the final session, and we appreciate it. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our panelists, but for now, let me just let me say something at the outset to orient all of us towards what it is this panel's doing compared to the last one. The last panel, of course, was talking about content collection, the policy wisdom of content, I'm sorry, metadata collection, the, con the policy wisdom of collecting metadata, why it's done, what the costs and benefits are, what the legality of it might be, and, and then how to reform it if it's to continue at all. Here, we're moving away from metadata, though maybe it'll make a guest appearance. When we talk about content collection, we're talking about actually capturing the substance of communications, maybe capturing it live, maybe capturing it after it's come to rest elsewhere, um, to talk about the same abstract questions. How is it done? Why is it done? What are the issues that are raised? And what might the path forward be? We have two wonderful panelists yet again. On my right is Tim Edgar. Tim's a fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law. Uh, Tim was the first White House National Security Staff Director for Privacy and Civil Liberties. Before that, he was the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, first deputy, or the first deputy at ODNI for Civil Liberties. And as I mentioned before, he had a position in the Civil Liberties community uh, before going into government. He was the ACLU's Counsel for National Security and Immigration Law uh, at the time of the 9-11 attacks and for years thereafter. On my left, Jennifer Granick. Jennifer directs the Civil Liberties Program at Stanford Center for Internet and Society. And previously, she's been the executive director of that organization. And before that, or, or in between those positions, actually, uh, she was at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where she was the Civil Liberties Director. She's taught courses ranging from computer crime law to internet law and policy. So we have two very capable speakers. And I will, I will start it off by inviting Tim, if he's uh, willing, to orient the group sort of as we did with the last panel by talking about the different modalities of content collection. And, and what I basically have in mind is talking a little bit about FISA as, as a particular kind of content collection, distinguished from 12333, and distinguished from the Section 702 program. Uh, sure. Thanks very much, Bobby. Um, basically, so I, I, I think it's important to keep content separate here. Uh, we just heard the Deputy Director of NSA and the General Counsel of NSA basically say content collection directed at Americans is always going to be a Fourth Amendment or legal issue. There's actually a little bit of uncertainty about email in some cases, but um, that's a somewhat, I, I think that's correct, and it's, it's a, a, a good conservative approach to take for any intelligence agency. Um, so unlike with metadata, where it, it may be at least um, uh, under current law, the argument that uh, it's not protected by the Fourth Amendment, so you could collect it in bulk and then do various types of analysis, uh, you could not collect content in bulk if you're talking about uh, Americans because that would implicate Fourth Amendment uh, concerns. So w how does the NSA collect content and how has it done it historically? Uh, first, it's, it's important to understand that uh, the National Security Agency has been doing this for many decades, uh, collecting international communications all over the world. That was what it was set up to do. Um, and, and how did it do that? Uh, well, it does that now under Executive Order 12333, uh, which regulates how the entire intelligence community protects the privacy and civil liberties of Americans. Um, that gives them the authority to collect communications when uh, those communications are not defined in FISA, in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, as being covered by FISA. So you have to look at the FISA definition. If you want to talk about you know, really geeking out on surveillance law, uh, check out the definition of FISA, electronic communication, um, and it's, it's a complex four-part definition written in 1978 and largely unchanged since then. Um, and it was carefully written to exclude a lot of what NSA does. Uh, when the Church Committee, which investigated abuses of the intelligence community back in the 1970s, looked at the NSA, they were concerned about the NSA's activities as they related to the rights of Americans. Um, I, I want to talk in a little bit about the rights of foreigners, because that's a new issue for the intelligence community that's come up since the Snowden revelations, really, a, a new concept. Uh, Congress wasn't concerned about that. They were concerned about protecting the rights of Americans. They were also had done extensive uh, work in figuring out how it is that the NSA does its activities, a classified work 
uh, which you know now in the wake of all this transparency, we, we can sort of understand what they were looking at uh, in a way that we couldn't for many decades. And basically what they said is they made a definition that was very specific to the technology of surveillance. They said if the NSA is collecting the communication outside the United States, then the only thing we're going to prohibit is targeting a particular known U.S. person through that collection. They can vacuum up lots of communications outside the country. They apply minimization procedures, essentially, to protect privacy of Americans. Um, but uh, they, they can essentially do that collection as long as they're not targeting a particular known person. Well, can you explain uh, minimization? Yeah, what do, we, what do we know about minimization under 12333? 12333 requires that the Attorney General issue procedures to all the agencies and departments, including the Department of Defense, uh, and has done so. Uh, under and, and those aren't public, though. Uh, actually, most of them are now public. The, the uh, they have been for quite a while. Um, and uh, the the USID 18, United States Signals Intelligence Directive 18, I think, is declassified almost in its entirety at this point. Um, you can Google it and find it online. Um, and that's the full extent of the minimization procedures. Yeah, it's pretty extensive three. procedures. Um, well, it allows a lot of uses, though. Yes, that's true. A lot of uses of U.S. So, person so data, un too. Unpack it for the audience. Cause it's so, so, so the point is that you can collect communications outside of FISA under Executive Order 12333, uh, and then the uh, NSA has to apply Attorney General-approved guidelines and its own procedures for implementing those guidelines uh, that say that the information has to be necessary to understand foreign intelligence and for other uh, purposes as well, including, uh, for example, criminal information, other categories of information, uh, that they can retain. Uh, in general, if it doesn't fit one of those categories, then that information, if it concerns a U.S. person, has to be uh, minimized. It has to uh, redact the identity of that U.S. person in any report that's uh, sent to any other agency, for example. Let me, let me pause there. <coughs> Jeffrey, you sounded like you were imagining some uses that this would allow that made you uncomfortable. Was there something particular? Well, you I, I just, I think, you know, we should be clear because when you look at what the minimization procedures are, so basically what we're doing in the foreign intelligence world is we're doing um, ma a massive collection and then we're trying to say, okay, we're going to apply the privacy protections on the back end and in mostly in secret. And this is something that though we've been doing it for a while is uh, relatively new. And one of the reasons it's relatively new is because now so much U.S. person data is going into these, uh, into these databases of information. Why is that different from so the, before? Well, one reason is the internet, right? We have U.S. person data to a much greater extent than ever had been technologically true before is flowing over foreign switches because that's the way the internet works. In the olden days, if you were listening to foreign telephone switches, maybe you were getting just foreign communications. Now when you listen to foreign switches, internet switches, you U.S. person data is there. The other thing is um, now we're doing, uh, NSA is doing collection of information inside the United States through uh, Section 702 without there being any kind of uh, suspicion or probable cause to believe either that a crime, is, that the person's involved in a crime or that the person is an agent of a foreign power, which was uh, what you needed to do under traditional FISA. So we're relying on these minimization procedures that were uh, written a long time ago and that allow rather extensive use um, of U.S. person data for foreign intelligence purposes and for criminal purposes have almost no protections for non-U.S. persons in an age where we have so much more data about everybody in the system. So just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's not, I, I don't know that I would necessarily disagree with any of that. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, I was talking about EO 12333 collection, I wanted to transition to talk about FISA collection. Um, so basically the NSA, uh, you know, can collect this information outside of FISA, doesn't need a FISA court order, and it has never needed a FISA court order for several decades to collect information outside the United States. Uh, the definition of electronic surveillance also allows the NSA to collect information as long as they're not targeting a particular known U.S. person uh, over the air. And that's a confusing provision for a lot of folks like me who think that means wireless telephones. That's not what it means. It means uh, signals that are acquired over the air and primarily has to do with satellite communications. Again, this was written in 1978. A lot of what the NSA did back then uh, was collecting international communications through, through radio uh, uh, interception. Um, and, and that's where most of the international communications were back then. Now that's transitioned to the internet, that's transitioned to uh, servers and switches which are very much wire communications. 
So the final point is, if it's a wire communication, and this definition, again, is uh, very complex, and you're inside the United States, then you pretty much need a FISA court order. Um, and it's a very strict standard because that communication, that'll be electronic surveillance, which means if you didn't get a FISA court order, it's a crime if you're an intelligence agency, um, if, the, uh, if either party is inside the United States. Um, and, and so that, that made it difficult for the NSA to direct its surveillance. Uh, if, if they were collecting off of a wire or a switch or a server in the United States, it made it difficult for them to direct their surveillance at a foreign target overseas, even a foreign target overseas who was communicating mostly with other foreign targets, um, if they didn't go and get a full-blown probable cause uh, order under FISA prior to 9-11. Um, and that is really not what Congress intended FISA to do. Congress, I think it, it's pretty clear from the legislative history uh, that Congress intended FISA to require a secret court order to surveil people primarily Americans inside the United States. That's what they were concerned about. They wanted to wall off, for the most part, NSA's traditional signals intelligence activities directed at foreigners outside the United States. Now, there's always been an issue of what about when foreigners outside the United States are communicating with Americans inside the United States. Um, and Congress made the judgment back in 1978 um, and basically reaffirmed that judgment with some changes in 2008 with the FISA Amendments Act uh, that those privacy interests could be handled through minimization procedures rather than by requiring an individualized warrant for foreign targets outside the United States. So against the backdrop of this basic framework, and I'm, let me just restate it really simply and overgeneralizing things for the benefit of those in the room who don't spend all their time, as Tim put it, geeking out like we do on this stuff. You've got a basic paradigm of externally foreign-directed, not Fourth Amendment-sensitive collection that's, that's rather wide open, and then a post-1970s reaction that carves out, using a pretty technical definition, a subset that's meant to capture the Fourth Amendment sensitive stuff and require judicial oversight, a special kind of warrant, the FISA process. And then into the mix comes a technological change, or at least an arguable technological change, that causes the scope that's in that FISA realm to expand over time and encompass more and more. You get to 9-11, and for a period of time after 9-11, there's a category of foreign to U.S. or U.S. to foreign communications in which the FISA definition, thanks to this technological growth, does seem to apply, but the president makes the determination to have that, those communications surveilled without going through the FISA process anyways. This becomes public years and years ago. We all may recall December 2005, the New York Times reveals this story. And what follows is you know, what used to be the big post-9-11 privacy debate. That, that was then. The upshot of that debate was, greatly simplifying things, passage uh, of statutes, the, the one we want to talk about is the one we talked about earlier, the FISA Amendments Act, which in 2008, I believe, creates a statutory override of sorts that pushes back the FISA definition a little bit and re recreates space for relatively free uh, collection in the circumstance where you reasonably, you have reason to believe the target's outside the United States and is not a U.S. person. That's the thing called Section 702. So in short, we've got 12333 as the shorthand for the broad, unconstrained, foreign focus collection. We have FISA for complex circumstances that are oriented towards us here, and Section 702 that sort of tries to bridge the gap. Into this mix comes the uh, disclosures of last summer, and we start hearing terms like PRISM and, and UPSTREAM. And so I think the most useful thing of all that we could do right now is to connect the, what was exposed and try to, try to show how it stems from or is different from or how does yeah. it relate to all these things we just said. Yeah, so um, PRISM and Upstream are two aspects of, uh, of content collection under Section 702, which is this law that was passed in uh, 2008. And PRISM is a code name for collection of information from providers where Google, Yahoo, Apple, Microsoft will hand over the contents of their customers' communications. Um, that is uh, something that companies often call going through the front door with, a, uh, with a, um, some kind of legal process to get that. And then upstream collection is a means of grabbing content communication off of the internet backbone 
um, which is a different sort of collection. Now, one of the things that's true about uh, upstream collection is it allows the NSA to collect information about targets. So you might be under the misperception that a target is the person who's being listened to or the person whose information is, whose emails are being collected. That's not accurate. The target is the person or entity to, from, or about which the NSA wants information. And what Section 702 does is it allows uh, the government to collect one and foreign communications either to, from, or about the target, so long as the target is a non-U.S. person reasonably believed to be overseas. Can I ask you a quick question on that? Yeah. Just from a Fourth Amendment perspective, just the Fourth Amendment, if, if I'm party to the communication and I'm the target, I, I get that. My, my Fourth Amendment interests are clearly implicated. Right. But if it's two other people and they're, they happen to be talking about me in the communication or writing about me, Where's my interest? Yeah, you as the you as the entity about which they're talking don't have a fourth. I don't think you have a fourth amendment interest there, but the people who are communicating do. And what it seems to me from the various discussions is that um, the government agrees that there's a fourth amendment interest here, at least on the part of the U.S. person yes. whose communications are being collected or listened to. And that that Fourth Amendment interest of us, when we talk to people overseas who either are targets or we're talking about targets, that interest is vindicated not by getting a traditional warrant under the Fourth Amendment, but under the national uh, secure, uh, what, a, a purported national security exception to the warrant requirement, which is satisfied by the fact that its national security is good enough, and then we have these after-the-fact minimization procedures that are supposed to, to be of comfort for us. Now, I want to be really clear about what Section 702 does for a minute, because we hear the jargon, and I've just given you the legal jargon, which is it allows us to target non-U.S. persons reasonably believed to be overseas. And I think that that framing, although accurate, is misleading because that has led people to believe, and by people I mean members of Congress as well, that this doesn't really have anything to do with U.S. persons' communication data, and that the collection of our emails and our phone calls is just incidental, which leads people to believe that there's just a couple of incidents in which this occurs. But what, this, what it means when you can collect people overseas talking with U.S. persons, it means that this allows the warrantless acquisition of our communications when we talk to people overseas, if it is for this foreign intelligence it, purpose and it's the right target. When, That's the purpose of right, the statute. Right. When we are talking to, just to be very clear about this, when we are talking to uh, people overseas who are targets of the NSA's collection. No, because and of yes, about collection yes. under upstream. So, so I want to I clarify the abouts because it's actually very important here. Um, the about is only in a very narrow sense. Uh, it is not if I am talking, for example, to Bobby about Osama bin Laden. If I send an email to Bobby, which includes, you know, the IMIE number or the subscriber number of bin Laden's cell phone, which nobody else knows about, then that communication will be captured. That's basically the issue. Under upstream collection, <laughs> essentially the way it works is the NSA is looking for unique identifiers. That's how they target people reasonably believed to be overseas. That could be an email address or a uh, unique identifier associated with some, some other form of communication. And the reason the abouts issue kind of comes up at all um, is because that uh, identifier then, then essentially is captured by the way that the system works. And the question for the NSA is basically uh, what if that identifier appears not in the to or from portion of the communication, but in some other part of the communication. They went to the FISA court uh, with this issue. Uh, they certainly understood and recognized that if there is a U.S. end, which there wouldn't always necessarily be uh, to the communication, that there would be a Fourth Amendment question here, um, made the argument that it was reasonable under the Fourth Amendment, and the FISA court agreed with that argument. Um, so uh, I think it's a bit of a stretch, frankly, under the statute to say that it allows this. Um, but on the other hand, there's an important national security reason why you wouldn't necessarily want to get rid of a communication that actually included the unique identifier of, let's say, a high-level high al-Qaeda operative. Well, and that leads me to another point, which I think is very critical here, and that is that the effectiveness issue, I think, is actually fairly clear when it comes to Section 702, uh, much clearer than it is for the metadata collection program. 
uh, the NSA has cited, uh, or the government has cited, 54 <coughs> terrorist attacks which have, uh, in which uh, 702 or 215 have made a material contribution. Um, and even if you read the PCLOB's own report where they basically question some of its 215 uh, examples, every, you know, m many of the examples begin this way. The NSA intercepted an email. Then they collected other intelligence. Then they used the 215 program. Uh, the, the email part of it is, is responsible, I would say, for, you know, large majority of those 54 uh, attacks, and you can see why. If, if you have uh, good coverage of communications of people overseas who are reasonably believed to be uh, overseas and, and are members of Al-Qaeda, it, it's certainly helpful to intercept the content of their internet communications. I, I'm not going to touch on effectiveness. I, I accept to say that I don't think that the NSA has a good way of measuring whether something's effective. I don't think that the public has a good way of measuring whether something's effective. I don't think Congress does. And this is something that the PCLOB, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, has specifically been trying to figure out. How do we know if something's useful? And then if it is useful, how do we decide whether it's worthwhile? Are there other ways? Could we have done it more privacy protecting, et cetera, et cetera? So at this point, I think based on whatever information is public, it's completely speculative for us to talk about uh, what's effective uh, or what's not. I think there are several first, public sorry, examples. But the first part is about the selectors. Now, the selectors are what is called the things that help pull this information off of the Internet backbone and get you into the NSA database. And so a very important issue is what are the selectors and what are the rules about what kinds of things selectors can be. Now, when testifying before the PCLOB, um, some of the people in this room said selectors are things like email addresses or phone numbers. So that can be good if it's an email address that nobody really knows. It's something unique and kind of secret and I wouldn't know what it is. Um, or a phone number. I shouldn't no necessarily know the phone number of some terrorist safe house or something like that. Also mentioned were unique name, like non-unique names, generic names. But, you know, what are the unique names? What does this mean? So we might think, and we really need, somebody needs to, whether it's Congress or the PCLOB, to really drill down on what these selectors are because this makes all the difference between how much innocent people's communications are getting sucked into this database and how many aren't. Um, remember, we're not just talking about counterterrorism collection here. Um, we have information that the categories of information that the FISA court has authorized 702 collection under are cyber uh, counterterrorism, cyber threats, and weapons proliferation. What is a selector for weapons proliferation? Is it only people who are trading in weapons, or are we tracking, let's say, um, articles in magazines that tell us how to build pressure cooker bombs? If that's the selector, and you're communicating about that article with somebody, because um, you're interested in what happened at the Boston Marathon or something, you're communication can be pulled off of the No, that's line. not, that couldn't be a selector. I mean, it has to be a target of a person reasonably believed to be overseas. So, so no, an article about how to build a bomb could not be a valid selector. It, it would have to be a selector associated with a person reasonably believed so to be overseas. So you're saying that cyber threats and weapons proliferation analysis can only target individuals or organizations and not uh, information published by by those individuals or organizations? Uh, uh, under, or under Section 702, that's absolutely correct. Is that, is that right? Well, also the statute, the statute requires that the uh, that, that, that the surveillance target persons reasonably believed to be overseas. Uh, so I think that makes it pretty clear. This is we're talking. We're not talking about bulk collection. We're talking about targeted collection directed at particular persons reasonably believed to be overseas. And um, 
you know, unlike the activities of the NSA, perhaps under 12333, which may be less constrained, um, this statute is somewhat of a middle ground between, you, you know, the old FISA law that applies to uh, domestically, applies to agents of foreign powers inside this country who can be surveilled under a FISA uh, application, um, and the activities out outside the country which are relatively unconstrained other than the minimization procedures, uh, I it's a bit of a hybrid. It, it, first of all, it, it has a court requirement, which, uh, by the way, is completely unique in the world. There is not a single other country that requires uh, a court to be involved in intelligence, uh, intelligence activities like this in terms of surveillance. Uh, in fact, there's not even a single country in the world that requires a court for domestic uh, surveillance inside the country. In, in Britain, they have the Home Secretary can sign off on it. In Germany, there's a parliamentary committee that can sign off on it. Um, so I, I think it's actually an extraordinary achievement to have that court involvement. Uh, this is not just court involvement for domestic surveillance, it's court involvement for a type of externally directed surveillance. Um, it's, it doesn't require individualized probable cause for the very reason that when you're directing your surveillance at someone outside the country, a person reasonably believed to be overseas, so it's been true for decades that the Supreme Court has said that person does not have Fourth Amendment protections. Um, what we've debated a little bit recently, um, and the President announced in January, is, is something I think is actually extremely significant, and, and that is the fact that the President announced and, and directed the DNI over the course of the next year to come up with some kinds of rules that might specifically protect the privacy interests of foreigners. Uh, this is a dramatic departure for, conceptually, for the intelligence community. Um, I've argued in an op-ed in The Guardian that, I, I first, first of all, I, I favor this. I think that we should restrain our activities um, against foreigners to protect the privacy rights of everyone in the world. Um, but I, I also think that it's not, perhaps, as dramatic a departure from intelligence practice as people might otherwise think. And that's because all of these activities, uh, including the oversight of the FISA court, including the oversight of offices like, like John DeLong and, and Alex Joel in the intelligence community, um, although they may have been set up primarily to look at U.S. person rules and U.S. person protections and minimization protections, they have uncovered uh, I issues that involve uh, abuses or compliance incidents involving the rights of foreigners. And, uh, and those people have, in fact, been disciplined for those. Um, and, you know, it, it's not, in fact, permitted uh, for everything you do in the intelligence community to have to have a lawful intelligence purpose. Um, that purpose is measured against the intelligence requirements the community has. So if you're doing something outside of that, um, w which abuses the privacy of, of a foreigner, what you're doing is actually a violation, even though uh, we don't think of, of those rules as, as having the purpose of, or having the, uh, the purpose of protecting the rights of foreigners, they, they in fact have that effect. So l just to take a comment about bulk and then a question about, or, or a comment mm -hmm. about what we can do with it, you know, the, the, uh, these definitional games are just really unhelpful. It's like, is it bulk, is it game. targeted, what is, you know, what is it? This is warrantless, suspicionless collection of communications that are either foreign to foreign or one end foreign. Um, we don't know exactly how many. What we do know is that in 2011, the FISA court said that 250 million communications had been pulled either through PRISM or through upstream surveillance that year. So 250 million communications from inside the United States under Section 702. So when I say mass surveillance, I think 250 million counts. That might not be your definition, but it is warrantless and suspicionless collection on a very large scale. Now what happens once those communications are in NSA databases, once it's collected with these rules, what can happen? Well, can they search for U.S. person information about us? And can they search for information about us just for national security purposes, for national security plus general foreign intelligence purposes, or what about criminal stuff? Well, once the data is in NSA databases, they can do what uh, Senator Ron Wyden has called backdoor searches and search that treasure trove of information using U.S. person selectors. In other words, your email address, your phone number. I think that's a real mischaracterization, actually, uh, of, of, I mean, I think it's a serious mischaracterization of the rules that apply to the NSA. Um, the NSA is a foreign intelligence agency. Uh, yes, if they come across something like for example, a serious you're, you're crime. You're talking about the NSA, but what about FBI, CIA, FBI all the doesn't other? have access to that database. 
I mean, th that's, that's the whole point, right? Th they, they collect the information, they keep it under uh, the NSA's rules, under uh, USIT 18, and if they want to share that information outside the NSA, uh, they, well, the first thing they would have to do is apply their minimization procedures and do an intelligence report uh, to send that to another agency. Um, if they wanted to share that information at an earlier stage, uh, they would have to go to the FISA court and get approval for a very kind of limited form of, uh, of intelligence sharing, which is something that, you know, Congress and has, you know, encouraged over, over many years since 9-11. Uh, I, I don't think that's correct. I mean, I really don't. I think that, you know, if, if you want to, I don't think it's a word game to say that there's a difference between collecting everything and putting it in a database and analyzing it and having a series of selectors which you use to select out particular things you're collecting. Those are two different forms of collection. You might think that those selectors don't have, you know, enough checks and balances. You might think that there should be a probable cause requirement even though the person's overseas. They might think the minimization procedures need to be tightened. Um, th those are all valid objections, but I, I think it's wrong to kind of mix those two things together and say they're the same kind of collection. They're just not the same kind of collection. Can I ask a clarifying question? I want to understand the, the category, the, the backdoor category, which we've started to hear a lot more about, and I think we're going to hear more about. And, and so we, we begin with the assumption for this discussion yeah. that some information has been gathered under 702 and has come into a database, and it's all been done properly under 702 using selectors that involve uh, a belief that this is a non-U.S. person outside the U.S. But there's probably some U.S., there's one in foreign communications that have U.S. persons involved in there. It's now in the database, so we're no longer talking about collection. Collection stage one, we're now talking about querying the database. or analysis. It, and, and it's an analysis step. As long as it's for foreign intelligence purposes, is there anything in, in USID 18, that's the United States Signals Intelligence Directive 18, which is the phrase we've been using as a shorthand, that's, that's an internal NSA uh, implementation of constraint. Is there anything, as long as it's foreign intelligence purposes, is it okay to use my name or your name or U.S. person name? You know it's a U.S. person in the U.S. You believe, yeah. you have a reason to believe maybe I'm involved in Al-Qaeda. Can you plug me into the database to query? I, I think that's the big point you just said there, which is that, that you know, there's a foreign intelligence purpose to what you're describing. So I if there isn't, if it were my email uh, or Jennifer's email uh, and there was no foreign intelligence purpose, then the fact that her information might be in that database because it was incidentally collected uh, would not mean that there's a backdoor exception to the minimization procedures. In fact, the minimization procedures apply at each stage. They apply collection, they apply at retention, analysis, dissemination. So y it's not just that after you're collected, it's all fair game. That's not the way it works. I think John had an extra point maybe to make. Right. Uh, okay, yeah. Can that's you, true. Can that's well, true. Let's get that clarified. So yes. 702 minimization procedures that apply to the 702 data. The, 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 this is the person whose job it is to make sure that people at NSA are applying the correct well, set of minimization procedures to the correct well, set let, of data. Let's ask, what in the 702 minimization, do, do the 702 minimization procedures allow any intelligence agency to search the 702 collected data? Um, for U.S. person identifiers, and if so, is that just for foreign intelligence purposes, or can it also be for law enforcement purposes? Uh, so let me classify these documents in the lab here. Uh, on the CMAC website. Wait, Raj, wait for the mic. This is good stuff. Excuse me. Sorry. You are the CMAC Oh, I have them. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not actually secret. <laughs> but go, but go ahead. So, it. so it is available for everyone to, to look at. Um, the, there was an opinion by the FISC in 2011 that approve the procedures to allow for this sort of querying. And so, so everyone understands these, um, the idea of backdoor might give you the sense that it's happening outside the scrutiny of a court or Congress, but this is procedures approved by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. The standard is that a query has to be reasonably likely to return foreign intelligence information. And as you would see from this declassified court opinion, those, that standard applies for the CIA as well as for NSA uh, and I think the FBI has publicly said they can do these sorts of queries as well. I think the, the big picture issue, though, is that um, this question of incidental collection of U.S. person communications, and I don't mean to lean on that word to suggest that it's minimal or not a policy issue worth discussing, isn't one that's unique to foreign intelligence. If you're, a, if you're the FBI and you're conducting yeah. a, an investigation of the mafia, you go to court and you get a Title III warrant, um, 
generally, our historical precedence is that uh, it's the person you're targeting that has the Fourth Amendment right, and that's why you go to get a probable cause warrant on that U.S. person. But there's always, in any communication, someone on the other end of the line. That's the nature of a communication, two people talking. And so when Congress passed the FAA that we heard about earlier, this sort of incidental collection or collection of U.S. persons on the other end of the line uh, clearly was anticipated, which is why the statute says you have to have procedures approved by the court to deal with that. And so that's the discussion that we're having now about right. what those procedures should say. Yeah, let, me, let, me, let me send it up to Chris, who also wants to weigh in. I just wanted to add two points. First, um, there is a specific prohibition, it's not implied, but a specific prohibition um, to use any targeting of foreign persons reasonably believed yeah. to be in foreign places um, as a backdoor maneuver to essentially learn more about a U.S. person. Um, that would be called reverse targeting, um, and having considered that in the 2008 law, um, it was explicitly prohibited, right? And the auditors, the compliance, the oversight looks for such things to determine whether or not that has in fact taken place. Uh, further, I would say that these um, searches of U.S. person identifiers and the already collected materials, which have already shown themselves responsive to a foreign intelligence purpose, um, are a way to be more efficient about actually figuring out, now that you have this responsibility to determine what threat, what threat might be exposed in the pile, to more efficiently search the pile. An example, but not necessarily um, an exhaustive example, would be, um, is the New York Stock Exchange the target of a cyber attack by Party X on kind of the nation? Uh, turns out that's a U.S. person query. You cannot ask the question of the database unless you do so under the conditions prescribed by the court. So from an NSA perspective, while I kind of take the point um, that this looks like um, it perhaps is a slippery slope, NSA would say these are conditions imposed on NSA having been considered by the court um, as to how you would handle that situation that constrain our behavior as opposed to enable it or give us a loophole. Jennifer, you, how do you feel about some of the, the feedback you got on the concern you expressed? Does it settle all your concerns or there's some I feel I'm great no, I feel I've no. never heard this before and I feel great now <laughs> all right, good, we can all um, go. <laughs> you know so we, the, we ha there's so many details you need to understand here to really figure out what's going on so notice that and I was talking about we were talking about foreign intelligence but Mr. English said threat so foreign intelligence and threats are different things threats are a subset of foreign intelligence but it, foreign intelligence is much broader than that I agree with that they're not disconnected and I didn't, mean to, I didn't mean to actually slip away and say, therefore, my threat you know, scenario is a loophole. Right? There has to be a foreign intelligence connection right. to that threat. You know, and, and, and when I was talking about doing searches on the collected data for U.S. persons, you know, reverse targeting is sort of about having an ulterior motive. I'll, I would be very interested in knowing how auditors determine whether people have ulterior motives or not, but that's not really likely to come up, and it's not really what I think we're looking for. What we're concerned about is that there's warrantless and suspicionless collection that implicates um, uh, and is about U.S. persons to a degree we don't know, and that that trove of information can be searched for U.S. for our email addresses, for our phone numbers, right. not sure exactly for what else, and that that information can be used for not just to mitigate threats, but for foreign intelligence purposes, which is much broader, and can also and is you routinely passed on to law enforcement for use in prosecutions where normally you would have had to go get a probable cause warrant that there was evidence of a crime, and here you haven't had to do any of that. So, so I guess, I guess I'm, what I'm getting caught up on is this whole idea of warrantless, suspicionless surveillance of Americans. Um, it's technically correct to say that, um, it, depending on how you define of Americans. Uh, but as, as you know, Chris and Raj and I have sort of, I think, been trying to pound away at here, um, if the surveillance is directed at a U.S. person, it requires a warrant with probable cause. It's only if the surveillance is directed at a foreign target overseas, not just a foreign target generally, but a foreign target who is physically located outside the country, uh, that you can use the Section 702 procedure. And it basically raises pretty much the same privacy concerns that NSA's activities have raised since the 1950s, which is that they have never you know, sought individualized warrants to do their targeting of foreign targets overseas unless required to by a strange interpretation of FISA, um, you know, th they direct their targets at targets overseas, and yes, there's incidental, and that does not mean unsubstantial, there's a lot of U.S. person information in there, which is why they're an agency that requires extensive oversight. So I, I guess my question, Jennifer, is, 
do you think that whenever the NSA collects the content of any communication of anyone in the world, um, uh, anywhere in the world, directed anywhere in the world, uh, that they should be required to have a warrant based on probable cause? Well, let's talk about what those warrants are, right? Because the warrants traditionally, under traditional FISA, that were he for either collection that took place in the United States or was targeting United States persons was not that you, there was a crime or anything. It was just a warrant to uh, a probable cause that you were an agent of a foreign power. And, you know, the agent of the foreign power test did a lot of work in terms of narrowing down the categories of people who you would listen to and for what reasons. And I think that that test is actually really valid. Now, notice agent of foreign power doesn't necessarily mean like a government. It can be a terrorist group or something like that. But, you know, what we have now, th this isn't anything like the 1950s. The communications networks today are nothing like that. There's way more information about way more people traveling all over the place globally. Foreigners' information inside the United States, our information outside the United States. Um, as, as Chris said last night, this is all, you know, we're all on the same network together. So when we're doing this surveillance, you know, it you maybe used to be if you're su surveilling certain switches overseas, um, you're going to get foreigners and, you know, it's sort of narrower. I don't agree with the idea that Congress just intended to leave that unregulated. I think figuring out how to regulate that was hard, and they sort of decided to leave it alone in 1978, and we just sort of never got back to it. Oh, and it's been like a sleeper issue that slept until now. But whatever your interpretation of the, uh, of the um, congressional record is at that point in time, the time has come. Those, that information <coughs> matters. And I think to, to, to go back to sort of first principles and think about the idea, maybe yes, we should only be surveilling people if we have probable cause to believe they're doing something wrong or if they're agents of foreign powers. So, so if someone here is, or abroad. I mean, I, I, mean, I, just, I, I just want to understand it. Your, your argument, I mean, because I think logically you could go either way on this, basically. I, I mean, I think that you have this technological division that ends up with a very strange result. Uh, prior to the FISA Amendments Act, and that is that if I'm collecting on a switch inside the country, directing my surveillance at a strong selector of, you know, Anwar al-Awlaki, who I know is in Yemen, and I have his strong selector, and I do it, um, and I get those communications belonging to him, I have to get a probable cause FISA warrant before, uh, uh, before 2001, uh, before the President's uh, terrorist surveillance program, before the FISA Amendments Act. If I do that on the same switch somewhere outside the country, I don't. Um, so that's a sort of a strange result because the, you know, the, the concern about abuse, the concern about, well, how many people is Anwar al awlaki talking to who might be innocent Americans is the same. Um, now, you could, you could logically say uh, we're going to have a rule that you know, we have now, essentially, which is that we don't need an individualized probable cause warrant for that kind of surveillance. We do need procedures to show that we actually do have reason to believe the person's overseas. Um, or we could just say we're going to have a warrant for everybody all the time, including if the NSA is collecting, um, you know, from a computer switch in Iraq about, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, a, an insurgent group in Iraq. I, I mean, it, you know, I, I don't think that makes sense. Um, I, I think that that's, going too far in terms of judicial review of intelligence activities. Um, but, you know, are, is that what you're advocating for? You advocating I don't think we less? have I don't think we have the information necessary to make that policy decision. I do think that we have the information necessary to say that we should not be conducting suspicionless surveillance on people just because they're not US persons. I think we know that. outside the U.S. while you have to target them. I just can't let it be said that the government targets foreigners for no reason. It just doesn't happen. Well, under 12333, look at the information that, that's been collected. So um, w it was uh, 400,000 address books and contact lists from uh, Yahoo and tens of thousands from Google in a single day. I mean, how, how is this information being collected overseas? You know, we ha we're collecting an immense amount of information that is, uh, I don't know whether it's whether you guys think it's contents or not, but that's a lot of personal data. You know, similarly, when we're talking about metadata, you know, the metadata conversation we had here about phone records sort of suggested, like, collecting phone records inside the United States is the only way to know who Yemen is calling inside the United States. Well, we also collect 
uh, telephone metadata outside the United yeah. States that can tell us who but, Yemen but, is calling. But actually, that was the gap that they, that was exactly the gap that they had at 9 11, was that they had collected so that information from the Yemen safe house. They didn't have the US end. That's what they needed. Is that a technological feature that is uh, a one-off feature of 2001 is no longer true for phone switches in general? Or is that part? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, 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 that's so the, this is technologically so, so complex. Bobby, it depends on how far down you want to go on this. Um, so I can do a fast forward or transform on the board if you'd like. Uh, turns out uh, it's not necessarily true that the technology that NSA would have access today could get both sides of the conversation. Let me give you a case in point. Imagine an Inmarsat terminal out on some back plane um, of Yemen, and it's kind of focused on a satellite that's kind of up, and it then has um, the reception of the satellite beaming down. Right? You actually have to be in two places to get both ends of that conversation. Right? That's still true today for a vast array of devices. Mm -hmm. um, so you might not be on the switch. You might be somewhere else trying to actually do this, because you're always, um, if you're NSA, the unintended recipient. <laughs> Let's open it up to the, uh, the audience in our remaining time. Julian. One of the reasons I'm uh, you know, kind of uh, a little frustrating when, when the, you know, the example of selectors is always um, stuff like email addresses and phone numbers is that um, there's uh, some of the, the leaked docs uh, concerning the targeting of more foreign malicious actors and the examples of these are WikiLeaks and uh, the Pirate Bay include discussions that make it reasonably clear that one of the things they're doing is targeting entities, again, WikiLeaks, the Pirate Bay and their servers, um, and then using the IP addresses or ranges of those servers as, uh, as the tasking selectors. And it struck me at least intuitively um, that whatever you think about the appropriateness of, of collecting incidentally US person communications when you're tasking on a foreign individual's email address, let's say, um, there's a very different considerations come into play when what you're tasking on instead is an entire website or server um, you know, in order to target an entity. And I wonder whether, whether there's some sense in which, you know, there's a recognition that not all selectors are created equal and that tasking an IP address might be different and require uh, stricter constraints than tasking on an email address. Well, I, I don't know whether Raj or Chris wants to tackle that, but I would, I, I, well, that, that's, very, that's, a comforting, that's a comforting answer from Raj. I, I would just say that, in my opinion, um, w one of the proposals I've made for reform, in addition to having restraints on spying on foreigners, although not a full-blown probable cause warrant, in my opinion, I think that would go too far, um, is that there should be uh, more uh, involvement of technologists at every level of this process. And that includes at the FISA court itself. I think that the FISA court would benefit greatly from having a chief technologist or a special master um, who is a computer scientist uh, who would go to the uh, Justice Department, uh, would go to the NSA, would, exact, would ask exactly that kind of question. Uh, might say, hey, well, I've looked at your minimization procedures, I've looked at the targeting procedures, uh, it says selectors, it says like email addresses, and then gives the classified answer that Raj isn't giving us about what all of them are. Uh, gosh, range of IP addresses seems a lot bigger than an individual email address, if that's what it is. Um, you know, can you give me more information about this? I think that would be very useful. A and it goes to the question of the complexity of internet communications. You know, we talked about <coughs> metadata in the last panel. We we're talking mostly about telephony. That's because, as, as Chris mentioned again, um, the internet metadata thing was such a mess, basically they had to kind of stop doing it. Um, the, the, the line between data and metadata on internet communications is extremely fuzzy, if it even really exists at all. Uh, so, so I think that, you know, we do need to update continually uh, the way in which we protect privacy, and, and one of those is by addressing uh, the reality of internet communications being very, very different uh, than what, you know, the, the NSA has done for many decades. Bruce? Uh, uh, I guess we'll follow on from Julian. Uh, Raj, you told uh, Jennifer that you will, can't select on the article on pressure cookers, so you can't select on a URL, but I think that URLs can be selectors 
if it's, I don't know, you know, jihadi website chatroom.com. Uh, so can URLs be selectors in certain cases? And I'm more interested, can, can code be a selector? Can you look for code signatures like a McAfee antivirus program might that might be used by a terrorist threat, a cyber threat, a, a military cyber threat? So I, I think Bruce's question is, is a very good one. And the issue Julian raised is a very good one. But it also points out the reason why it's quite difficult as a government official to say that can, that can't, that can, that right. can't. Exactly. Because you, in fact, you don't want to let the terrorists and the Fatah know that you shouldn't use that URL if that were in the bill. Not that it is at all. At the point being, uh, ruling in or ruling out at that level of detail is difficult for reasons I think we would all understand. But I right. take the point that there needs to be greater discussion of how we can alleviate concerns that when I say something like, such as phone numbers or emails, that's not a way to get around um, to not mention something that's far more general that might raise other concerns. Well, well I, I, I'm a former government official, so I'll try to tackle this a little bit uh, more clearly. But, but all I would say <laughs> is that there is a statutory requirement that we're talking about here, and that is that you target, uh, the targets are reasonably believed to be overseas. And so I think the reaction that I had and that Raj had to this article idea is, how is that a target reasonably believed to be overseas, an article? You know, an organization I can see some argument. Um, I'm sorry, but or it's not. It's not a. It's not a person. It's not. Or well, okay. So you know about Al Qaeda. And the point is that the selector has to be associated with a target reasonably believed to be overseas. And what you were describing was not selectors based on targets. You were describing selectors that were based on content, on on yes. which which I think is not authorized by the statute. I mean, so I, I, I think that's actually quite clear that it's not authorized by so the so statute. That would be content selection of a large data stream, not selection of communications associated with a target. So you can't search for malware? Uh, no, absolutely not. I do not think that the Section 702 uh, authority would allow you to use this system for broad cybersecurity purposes. I, I'm always less concerned about authorities. You know, there are lots of them. They move around a lot more in general. Well, well they don't move. I mean, actually, they move very slowly. <laughs> the authorities are, are, you know, are constantly uh, uh, being overtaken by uh, the technology no, changes. No, what I mean, when you say we can't search for, med for malware under this authority, it means you can under some other authority. And that's, well, that's for example, under EO 12333, as we discussed, um, it's less constrained. EO 12333 says, that the NSA can engage in broad signals intelligence collection for foreign intelligence purposes, as long as it's not targeting a particular known U.S. person. Um, so, you know, there there are uh, when when you ask when you talk about, for example, the uses to which Section 702 can be put, uh, the fact that unlike the telephone metadata program, it's not limited to counterterrorism as that program is, um, but might include things like cyber threats and and, and uh, weapons proliferation, which I'm frankly very grateful for. I'd, I'd actually like the NSA to gather communications about people proliferating weapons of mass destruction. I hope they are doing that. Um, it, it's it's that, that, you know, cyber threats doesn't mean that they can just do broad cyber malware searches using Section 702. What it means is that for the purpose of combating cyber threats, they may target persons reasonably believed to be overseas under the procedures of Section 702. If we wanted to have a broader authority that said the NSA can get in the business of, you know, searching all of the Internet for malware uh, or defending the nation against malware, uh, that would require, clearly require legislation, and I doubt in this context that it would be very likely to pass. Jennifer, I'm going to give you the last word before we release our... Our crowd. Yeah, just a, a couple things. You know, one of the things that I think this conversation has brought forth is how much we are relying upon a very, very complicated set of rules to safeguard things that we hold precious in a democracy. And even the rules that are public and that were publicly debated by Congress, in other words, Section 702, are extremely complicated. And uh, there, it's various permutations, how it could be used, what it really means, what's current practice versus what could be practiced under a different uh, legal interpretation or a different presidential administration is really hard. 
And at the same time, we're allowing this vast amount of communications data, whether it be metadata or content, to come into government databases. And then we have these back-end minimization rules, some of which have been declassified, many of which have not, um, which are supposed to govern and protect how the information is analyzed, used, shared, uh, used in criminal cases, and, and that sort of thing. And these implicate not just our Fourth Amendment rights, but also our attorney-client privilege and Sixth Amendment rights, um, and all of these and other constitutional rights, as well as general concerns about the balance of power between individuals and, and government. So, you know, as lawyers, this is a lot of pressure on rules, and these rules are playing a role that technology used to play, or economic uh, expense used to play, where we weren't able to do bulk collection like this, either because companies didn't collect the data or because saving the data was so expensive or because people didn't communicate that much over the network the way we do now. But now it's become extremely cheap to do this kind of information collection um, it's, it's, we're, and we're looking to these, like, to these uh, technicalities, memoranda of understanding and secret minimization rules and things that never get litigated and that normal people don't understand to play the role that technological and economic impossibility used to play to keep the government within the realm of what we have grown up thinking of as being the limited, f the limited uh, impact that they have on innocent uh, people's lives. Let's thank the panel for an extremely interesting discussion. And please, all of you come back tomorrow. We are not done by a long shot. We will talk <laughs> compliance and the path forward throughout the morning tomorrow. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Jack.